I think uh, the new humanism of Pope Francis provides a beautiful framework for reflecting and practicing the nurturing of human resources, people in the church. That's why it's important, fundamental. I will try to speak as simple as possible, but you'll forgive me if I am a little abstract in certain things. But we can start it out in discussion. Let me start with a Greek myth, mythology story. It is about, it is a prehistoric times when there was no fire on earth. Uh, people were dying, children, old people, because cold and they were dying. And they were eating food not cooked. Therefore, fell ill and then died. So there was a man called Prometheus. Prometheus, he was a very sensitive heart. He could not bear the suffering of the humans. And he saw, lifted his eyes and saw, in heaven, gods were enjoying the fire in the big palace. Gods and goddesses were sitting around the fire, cooking the food, feasting. So he said, here on earth, people are dying, and these gods and goddesses are enjoying. I should do something, he said. So he wanted to steal some fire from the gods. So he made a journey to the upper world. And he was very clever because it's not easy to steal fire from the gods. So he wanted to distract gods and goddesses. So he got a golden apple and that he wrote this is for the most beautiful goddess and threw it in the courtyard. So they got it and big dispute started. Who is the most beautiful goddess? They were all distracted. So Prometheus took this chance to lit the fire and bring to the earth, but he was caught. And the god Zeus contributed everybody. He was a criminal, he was chained to the rock and confined to eternal torment. That's the first story of the first humanist mythology, you know, where the humans rebelling against God because the gods were not, you know, concerned about human beings, therefore affirmed the human being. And since then we had many kinds of humanism. So we have secular humanism, we have ethical humanism, existential humanism, and then you have uh, technology, all kinds of humanism. Then the history, especially in the West, we have the Renaissance, where Michelangelo, all those people, you can see all the human bodies celebrated. You can see David, you know, Michelangelo's, all those figures with anatomy, where Michelangelo used to go to moratorium, how do you call it? Yes. And then find human bodies, you know, how it is the, the human was the focus of attention, Renaissance, and the Enlightenment, everything. So what happened was that the Christianity, which is deeply human because it celebrates the coming of the opposite movement of Prometheus going to heaven, the God coming to the human. So it got distracted, Christianity, in a way, and entangled with this kind of humanism of renaissance and enlightenment, etc., 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 et cetera, and began to think that human beings are the center of the universe, which is not really the true Christian and biblical world. And therefore, as Protagoras said, man is the measure of all things, anthropos, metron, panthon. Man is the measure of everything. That has ruled the world for a long time. And Christianity forgot its truth that it contributed to demystifying, demystifying the nature, the earth, etc., etc. And what Pope Francis does is fundamentally this 
how do you call distortion which has happened which influenced also Christianity trying to re-mystify from demystification disenchantment to use the phrase of uh, Weber uh, de how do you call disenchantment the world is no more you know the, the, the world is beautiful wonder like a child you know look at the mountains and trees and rivers you enjoy that's wonderment you know there's nothing of that because science and technology has demystified so the humanism of Francis starts with re-mystifying see the world and universe together and therefore certain corrective to the distortion Christianity suffered during the centuries under Renaissance, Enlightenment, etc., etc. This is, uh, so he's reawakening, so he's not, uh, what do you call, in the sense of a revolutionary who has break with the past, he's reawakening the real deep Christian but forgotten dimension of the integrity of everything. So this is a brief introduction. With that, I would cover nine short points which you have in the summary in your hands, briefly. The first is that the whole shift, Francis effected, but is uh, not only one, from uh, what is called Anthropocene to a cosmological anthropology. Let me explain a little bit. Uh, Yuval Harari, a Jewish historian, has uh, two important books, Homo Deus, Human Being God, and uh, Homo Sapiens, Wise Man. And very interestingly, this historian, <coughs> Yuval Harari, speaks about history of the universe, and uh, you know that the universe is 13.5 uh, billion years old. And in this huge history, immense history, human beings are only a history of 60 or 70,000. A fraction of this huge history of 13.5 billion years old. And he says that our present world is conditioned by Anthropocene, technically. It means that the period of the universe where the human beings began to dominate. That's 50, 60 years. Anthropocene, and he says at one point, an insignificant ape, monkey, began to dominate the earth, everything. So when you connect the whole universe, the species human is only a small one. If theory of evolution is true, all of us were once mountains, rivers and trees. And what are we? We are bubbles in the immense stream of the universe. There are more stars in the heavens than grains of sand on the shores of our shores. Just imagine how many <laughs> grains of sand are there. There are more stars. So in that sense, the minuscule, the human, you know, constitutes. So this whole domination has taken place because that has taken place, you know, a kind of dissociation from the inextricably related to what happens in the world, natural world. And we have in Indian tradition, I'm sure if Christianity grew up in India, you know, instead of the West, it would have been very different. The nature would have been part of, very much part of, Panchabuddha, the five elements, you know, we have water, earth, fire, akash all the five elements. This is my one of the, because we should not make too much of idolatry of the Pope. Pope, many things he's taking up from, learns from others, it's wonderful. You know? So one thing, Laudato Si, is a very good document, but unfortunately there is a little reference to the Asian reference to, or do you call, Hinduism, Buddhism, how much it is one with the universe. You know the Indra's net, no, everything is interconnected and every part, the jewel, reflects the whole. This is part of. And we have, uh, what do you call this, Ayudha Puja, where you venerate you know, everything 
and give respect to that. And uh, this is something uh, wonderful. Human dignity is intertwined uh, with the dignity of creation of God. Now, one thing I would like, this is very important, this comes, which is, uh, which is a kind of Copernican revolution or rather turn, that for a long time it was said that human beings are end in themselves. Human beings are an end. You could never use human beings as an instrument, categorical imperative. Behave in such a way, can set, that you always consider human beings as end in themselves and never as a means. All exploitation takes place, human trafficking, because people are considered as a means for your own enrichment, you know, all that wealth, etc. End in themselves. So, human beings are considered an end in themselves, but now the new humanism, anthropology, integral anthropology, Pope proposes is that things also end in themselves. It's not only human beings, it's something very quite revolutionary, you know, but which is deeply embedded in the Asian tradition and cultures, Pope takes it. And we have the whole tradition of a cosmological aspect in understanding Christ as Alpha and Omega, the point towards which you move. Therefore, let me quote John 23rd Pope who said, we are here on earth not to preserve a museum, but to care for a flourishing garden. The earth as a garden. So the intertwining, and the entanglement of everything together, that's the first. What does that imply? for inverted commas formation or nurturing human resources. Let me spell out a couple of things. One, that we need to speak today not only of two loves, love of God and love of neighbor, but three loves, love of God, love of neighbor, and love of nature equally. Human life and actions we judge under the three loves. Uh, which reflects thisness. That is very much Franciscan tradition. Dan Scotus, Franciscan, Hechitas, thisness. That means not only something abstract, every little thing, thisness, you know, that you respect that thisness of things and the mindfulness of everything. Knowledge about intertwining of everything. Yesterday, Sister Unigo spoke about mystic, just want to add a footnote to what she said. Uh, you can be mystic even without prayer. Because sometimes mysticism connected with prayer could be alienating. Already we are overfeeding the farmies, spiritual formation, meditation, mass, reading, this, overfed. Therefore they omit. Uh, because it's too much. So, it is not mysticism in addition, you do prayer a lot and you are a mystic. No. Mysticism can be even without prayer in the sense that the realization of the unity of everything. That's a mystical. That everything is interconnected. The human community, the earth community, everything. As Karl Rahner said, a devout Christian of the future will be a mystic or uh, he will be, how do you call, uh, someone, uh, not anything at all, cease to be anything at all. So, it's a mysticism of open eyes. Prayer with closed eyes, but we want a mysticism of open eyes. The whole world is a garden of God, human beings. So a mysticism of open eyes, which is all, certainly will be also prophetic, and this is very important. So the integration of everything, which has got a therapeutic function. Therapeutic means healing, oh, it's too high. Healing function. The moment you integrate everything, it automatically heals someone. Therefore, division always is a source of uh, conflict. 
no disintegration so therapeutic healing we don't need so many what we call workshops you know if somebody a sister or a brother has a problem you go to that you know that kind of increasing but this this experience of integration of everything is a therapeutic and cultivate this deep love for nature and taste to wonder at my like saint francis of assisi sun you know, brother sun and moon sister moon and we need to cultivate nurture in the candidates you know people uh, a poetic sense poesis in greek means poein to make to create the creativity not create boxes of discipline where everybody will fit in but poesis is creative i will give you an example of how we lack poetry in the church poesis uh, there was a great poet kannadasan tamil nadu the great poet modern poet was uh, written lyrics also for films so many films and uh, he was commissioned to write uh, what do you call and uh, this one epic like and the life of christ uh, yesu kavya i remember he was in trichy he was in a hotel he was dictating he was a poet and he was a uh, writing verses about the child jesus so he is now telling about you know this uh, lullaby for the child jesus etc then time as very poetically he said tamil i would say then i would translate palaniyasu kan vilithu thungindar the child jesus sleeps with open eyes which is very poetic because in hindu tradition only god sleep with open eyes so he wanted to indicate so this text of kanadasan went to the bishops bishops were scandalized because said, jesus is a true human being therefore he must be he cannot open eyes and they brought to kanadasan and told him kanadasan so magnanimous so he said kan modi thungindar jesus closed eyes and slept <laughs> how we lack sense of poetry poetry creativity we need a lot more so young people are full of creativity foster nurture this creativity which is nurturing real sources open avenues for them if she or he is interested in this cultivate that you know that we give so much importance to <coughs> discipline and other things let me come to the second point humanism of a new sociality life is a web of relationships the wider we cultivate relationship the life flourishes intersubjectivity formation an environment a milieu of relationships when we help to forge relationships and do not allow isolation to take place when people isolate it becomes problems to themselves and others so if a brother or a sister or a priest isolate everybody is responsible for that not only he or she everybody because we have not created the environment where that person could integrate and uh, lack of relationships connected with the lack of rootedness uh, analyzing the modernity the how do you call uh, the, the father of modern sociology emil durkheim who wrote also about how suicide takes place you know in modernity connected he used a word anomie the modernity is considered anomie means rootlessness rootlessness the modernity says the urban life etc creates rootlessness and that is so we need to create root and create trust trust society is run by trust stalin famously said trust is good control is better he is a dictator no wonder no trust is good control is better 
probably many times we behave like that in our formation houses. Trust is good, control is better. No, trust is better always, even if mistakes take place. Uh, mutuality and solidarity. So new sociality is where uh, the face of the other becomes where God is reflected on the face of the other, the source of morality. And actually, I think Pope Francis has benefited a lot from Emmanuel Levinas, who spoke about the face of the other. It's a challenge to me, the face of the other. It's the beginning of morality. It's not a rule-bound morality. The other is a challenge to my morality. So it's a humanism of new sociality. Third, for the lack of time, I will go a little fast. Humanism of fraternity, brotherhood, and sisterhood. This is very important because this is a very crucial point and also what comes out of Fratelli Tutti is precisely this because we are in a modern world of contractual relationships. Modern society uh, is, social relationships are based on a hypothetical contract. Now, no time to explain what that is, but the contract. Commercial relationships are on contractual relationships. That kills. You cannot, a mother and child do not have contractual relationships. It's possible. Not all dimensions of human life can be, there are certain areas which can be under contract. But the larger life is that everybody is a brother or sister. You know? Religious life is a fraternity, that cultivation, fratelli tutti, that means not consider the other person as an alien, but a brother and sister, which means the binding is very close, like a family. That's what the Pope Francis is trying to underline. Religious life is a fraternity. And unfortunately, during the history of the church, clericalization took place, and therefore, hierarchy got embedded deeply. But if you see St. Francis and St. Dominic, the medical orders, uh, they were considered as brothers, frere, even today they will say brother, you know? even, even the ordain. The ordination was an, in its way anomaly. The religious are supposed to be brothers. And they started ordaining some religious and it became a general practice. I think we should go back to that. So that the clericalization stops. Because you need to also make a structural reforms. There were very few priests enough, brothers, more brothers. That's what is a need. Uh, and this is precisely one way of overcoming the deeply entrenched. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the religious life is a fraternity, a sisternity, sisterhood. So inculcate, uh, inculcate as a nurturing human resources, the capacity for dialogue in the families. And that will be one of the important you know, things. Um, and also, it's a form and preserving determination to commit oneself to the common good as part of fraternity, common good. Common good is an ensemble of conditions which create so that individuals and groups can flourish to the maximum of their capacity. Sorry, I don't want to go into an explanation of that, you know, the common good. Common good is a very important uh, category also in the social teaching of the church. The dignity of the human being and the common good. I will come to that common good again. No? Now, fourth point, uh, the, the element, fourth element in the humanism of Pope Francis is God is part of the definition of the human. That's it. You cannot exile God from human life. Yesterday I spoke about, you know, the, the visit of the, the parish priest in a world where people don't believe in God. Not a humanism which excludes God, but God is an integral part. Without, if you do not include God, you'll be prepared to do everything, to oppress, to kill, anything. And that's why Dotovsky, the famous Russian novelist said, if there is no God, everything is permitted. There is no God, everything is permitted. No? So God is the guarantor of the true humanity. 
And that is uh, something he underlined, and this very powerful message, especially to the West, where nihilism is taking hold of. So, it, okay. so this transcendental reference to uh, God. Without God, it will be exclusive humanism, naturalist humanism. The fifth point, humanism defined primarily by love, not by reason alone. The Aristotle famously said, you know, zoon, um, logicon, that means human beings have rational animals, rational animals, but then a reason. So what defines human beings are reason, and precisely also one reason where women were oppressed because they were considered not having enough reason. Therefore, uh, feminist studies are brought out, this is a wrong way of looking. The reason defines human beings, the men are reason, women are not reasonable, therefore they are lesser beings. This is it. No, that's only one. There is uh, the whole love, that's again Franciscan tradition, a Franciscan Pope. No. So you have, for example, in St. Bonaventure, very different from St. Thomas Aquinas who followed Aristotle, who says that knowledge is not only through our intellect, but through our heart. If you want to know something, you should love it. That's exactly the Franciscan way. If you don't love, you don't understand. Think of the consequences in a religious formation house. If you are only taskmasters, wanting them to follow exactly this, habituate them, then I think we are in the wrong. And therefore, uh, the, the love as the path to knowledge. Not simply knowledge is a dominating technocracy, dominion, control, therefore, I want to hear cite uh, Shusaku Endo, the Japanese novelist, Catholic novelist, who has uh, many novels, and he beautifully says that I would like to imagine God and Jesus as a mother rather than a father. And he says why he does like it, because he says the father is a disciplinarian, he expects something. Many times in our religious formation houses, we are more father, also sister's houses, no? Expect something, discipline. The mother is unconditional love, There's no expectation. You are accepted, and therefore he says, I would like to think of Jesus as a mother, precisely because the un unconditional character of love without expecting anything, compassionate mother. Every formish, formator should become a mother to the formies. Whether it's a father or not, no, father, infrequently everybody should become. Because, as Milan Kundera says, woman is the future of man. Beautiful. In the novel, in his novel, Immortality, he's a great novelist. Woman is the future of humanity. What's going to win is ultimately love and compassion, on which Pope Francis lays so much of emphasis, which is redeeming. Let me come to the sixth point. Human existence is not a finished product, so to the self. So, uh, we have a very essentialistic conception, no? Man is like that, tree is like that. This is what is called foundationalism. This is, this paves the way to domineering thinking. You define everything. This is it, this is it, and we want very clear mathematical certainty about everything. But human beings are like a river. It flows. The river, yes, but not always the same water. So many knowledge, so many uh, emotions, everything passed through, that changes. The sediments grow. You know? There is a whole uh, uh, movement. Therefore, we cannot judge a person simply, judgmental. Take note of the factual. Very often we tend in the church, this is very bad, to moralizing. We have only certain categories, good, bad, you know, like that, no? They are already called binary thinking, high, low, left, right, man, woman. This must get rid of, you know? Rather, think of things as they are, the factual, what is it, what is it? First, know it, what is it? Phenomenological, 
we need more phenomenological also in approaching people why instead of coming out with judgment you no know, how it thinks therefore help people to self discovery that lays the best foundation for uh, the farmers so that they discover their friend they say susi the swa care of the self you know, fashioning of self one self you know fashioning ultimately the person should is a work of art i fashion myself i can make use of the elements so do we provide the element so that the farmi fashions herself or himself in such a way you know creates etc seventh a new humanism of common good i said earlier i mentioned common good and there are two aspects to common good one is the ecological aspect which i underline first i don't want to repeat there's a social dimension that means uh in the christian tradition there has been disputes about this point of use and dominion use and dominion that means we are especially in religious life etc you use things you know that is it common dominion is possession so the power that is very bad possession so we must distinguish between use and dominion so sometimes i wonder you know priests and uh, sometimes house of bishops i have seen and people have complained they accumulate i don't know the personal bank accounts formerly there was no bank accounts for the religious now of course understandable reason you know you can and that was the reason on the power poverty that means everything is in common uh but possess so a priest or a bishop or a religion you have provided everything what else do you need you want to accumulate for what use is use dominion is a power that's a temptation you know the accumulation of uh, therefore uh, of course in the christian social tradition we have critic of private property the earth is made common for the whole humanity and uh, interestingly pope john the 23rd very beautifully said i am giving this concrete example instead of elaborating theoretically he said that people are going hungry because there is not enough food here is a man who has 1000 acres of land he does not need to cultivate he leaves it fallow is my possession my land is a john 23 says you have the right to go and occupy because the earth is common to all when they hungry you cannot allow it because it is a common property so the primacy of use of everyone precedes the right of property private possession in the modern world corporate world everything runs in the engine of private property ownership therefore the striking at the very root it should not be a means of possession therefore when priests religious etc etc tend to accumulate it means they want to control they want to i want to tell you one little example experience 30 40 years ago <coughs> sorry i went to jaffna before the war there was bishop dyagupalai they asked bishop bishop how many priests are there in your diocese looked at me and said one so to what is this big diocese how no i am the only priest all the others are bishops <laughs> <laughs> so i pity sometimes a bishop <laughs> because they have to manage with so many bishops you know the diocese this power struggle they want the prominent parishes prominent institutions you know the power and control you know, use and dominion the dominion tendency the use use it ask for it you know that i think uh, is very important you know uh, yes then let me come to uh, so the farm should be how do you call nurture in such a way that use things detachment 
from the desire for possession, it, it, it kills a person, you know, possession. Uh, eight, a new humanism from the periphery. You transform the world and society by transforming the periphery. A clear indicator of development of any society is what's happening in the periphery. Of course, uh, today they are priding that we are going to the fifth, uh, we got second largest economy, five trillion economy, etc., etc. It's all an illusion, you know, of uh, uh, general D GDP. India is out of 125 countries in the hunger index, 121st place. Can you imagine? Just four notches above. And we are priding, we are evolved power, etc., etc. This is all propaganda machinery, you know. But the actual fact is large peripheries, cities full of slums. That's another great issue which uh, church should face, the urbanization, etc., etc. So from the periphery, here I would like to be more concrete and narrate something and then finish that point. 2001, <clears throat> I was invited as a Joseph uh, professor for uh, uh, Boston College in uh, USA. Uh, so I was delivering the lectures. That time there was a visitor, extraordinary visitor, and the visitor was nobody else than uh, Father Ernesto Cardinal. Some of you may know, those who know about South Africa, I mean, uh, South American history, Latin America, from Nicaragua. At uh, one point, there was a whole struggle against the dictatorial regime, and then you have a new regime uh, came to power, which was more socialist, which was concerned about the people, and some of the priests were ministers in this. Ernesto Cardinal was a minister of education. The literacy was hardly 15, 20 percent. He raised to almost 90 percent literacy, the people. So I had the great privilege of listening to Father Ernesto Cardinal. His brother was also a priest, you know, Ernesto Cardinal. And he was addressing a few thousand students, you know, in the huge auditorium. And he was narrating about his novitiate uh, in Nicaragua. The novitiate was in a hill. And they used to assign jobs for each one. <clears throat> and uh, certain weeks, one uh, novice has to go down because uh, to the bakery and get bread. And Karna was telling, he was assigned and he used to carry bread for the novitiate. On the way, poor people stretch their hands for bread. So he used to give, give. When he comes back, there's no bread. So the superior chided him, the novice master. Then he said, either you appoint somebody or you'll have no breakfast. So if you want me to go. So that shows, you know, how sensitively this person has been trained. You know? He could not suffer the hunger of children and others. It's not so much that my superior has said, I must do this duty, that kind of thing. Let me come to the next point and concluding point. Jesus, the new man and model of a new humanism. Jesus' humanism is not an idea, becomes history. Many of his interventions, he respects people. He enters into a conversation, not give directives, discovers together with the Samaritan woman. What a beautiful conversation. Zero Phoenician woman. There's an there's a argumentative Jesus who argues with the people and they also allows others to argue with him. Let us allow our own farmers to argue with us and not to be superintendents. No? So beautiful which we find in Jesus as a point of reference for his humanism. Have among yourselves, and Paul says, the same attitude that is also yours in Christ. What is that attitude? And that is deep humanity. You, know, you could not suffer. Jesus was concerned not so much about sin, unfortunately the distortion of Christianity, therefore whole, uh, what do you call, uh, atonement, theory of atonement, salvation, not so much about sin as human suffering. 
what ritually touched him was human suffering. When it came to sin, he said, you seven times and seventy times you forgive and then your sins are forgiven all. That's quite minor. But what is uh, most important is human suffering, response to human suffering, that sensitivity, which is very important. Let me come to the conclusion. Uh, human beings are not objects, but subjects. This is very important, not objects to be treated. Subjectivity is the agent of change. There is autonomy, you know. Uh, autonomy means authos, you know, nomos in Greek means law. Law unto oneself, move oneself, autonomous, which is contrast to heteronomy. That means somebody comes from outside and puts the rule. I had a very humorous cousin who used to tell me that all the things I would gladly like to do, God has put under the Ten Commandments. So, <laughs> sometimes we think that by creating more rules, that we discipline and farm better, far from it. It's a banking system, a Paulo Ferreira, you know that, no? It's a banking system. You give inputs, no, nobody grows. A person grows, no, like a snowball, slowly. Therefore, understanding of the divine grace working in our farmers and in their history. Every person has a personal history, biography. This new humanism realizes the incommensurability of the human spirit. Please remember this word, incommensurability. You cannot measure a person. That's precisely mystery of human being, mystery of God. The encounter of the mystery of human beings and mystery of God. You cannot measure. You are not the judge. That's exactly what Pope said. Who am I to judge? In the case of, you know, the famous statement about the king. Not judgmental. Incommensurability. Respect of mystery. God's mystery taking place in the heart of everyone. That is very thing. Not make an idolatry of our founders and foundresses, all that. There were pious good women and men who were there in their particular age, fine, we venerate them, respect them, but must be here and now in the 21st century of India here. Yesterday I spoke about the programs for formation created in Rome and France cannot be applied here. We should have our own, because the situation is very different here, no? And the issues we face are different. And we have, uh, uh, we, we should not consider that we have a blueprint, a formation, and we are as executors, that the formers are part of the formation. Pros plan with them, you know, a process. Uh, in formation, I think we have an obsession with order. We are afraid of chaos. We should love chaos. Because we are too rigid, too rigid. Sister Inigo spoke about the rigidity. Too rigid. We are afraid of chaos, insecurity. The human life is full of fragility, imponderability. What happened with that? That's the basis of COVID experience the frailty of the human being, you know. Uh, you cannot plan everything for totality, no. So like uh, what happened, the medieval plagues, etc., etc., we realize deeply the transitoriness of everything, fragility, precarity of everything. Uh, therefore, we should not be worried about too much of security, too much of, how do you call, obsession with order. Think about the uh, workplace of an uh, artist, sculpture. Think about, you know, a person like Michelangelo's workplace. So much of probably, you know, debris everywhere, but something wonderful is happening. But our eyes go only here, it is not there, there, but look at what's getting formed. That's more important. Not insist, because we have trusted on habit formation. Let me explain, you know. That means we think 
that if we, this is called virtue ethics, you know, that if you culti- ask somebody to do, young, young person, repeatedly the same thing again and again, it becomes a habit. This trick does not work anymore. They will come, they will attend everything, but they have their own ways. So don't rely on simply habit formation as a security that the formi is formed well. No, not at all. They break the frameworks. Rather cultivate, come back to the main theme of our reflections, the new humanism of Jesus, the springs of humanity with the farmies. Yesterday I spoke we saw about the workers, the toll workers, you know, without any compensation, anything, the daring. Oh, but so simply, so spontaneously, naturally, there was no persuasion. Nobody was there to persuade. Immediately respond to a situation. That agility of the spirit, I think that is what is required. Thank you very much for your kind attention.